All right, ladies and gentlemen, Josh Coker here, AKA Josh Miss Prime, and we're gonna jump right back in to part two of our Minotaur Archetype series. In the first episode, or first part, I spoke to you all about the original myth of the, the Minotaur that came from Greece. And I tried to keep it, it was an abridged version, I tried to keep it simple. You know, there are plenty other videos and books out there that will give you in-depth explanations. For the purposes of this series, you only need to know the abridged version because, um, one, there are several different variations of it, and two, pardon me, I have something in my eye, and two, there are other more important things that we need to discuss. So, for example, in this episode, I'm gonna talk to you all about the physical attributes of a minotaur. The minotaur is roughly seven feet tall. It's significantly larger than an average human, um, but not, not super gigantic. And its main attributes are that, this is the stereotypical or the prototypical minotaur, uh, is roughly seven feet tall, maybe a little taller, maybe a little shorter, but roughly seven feet tall. Um, it has a bull's head. That's the most significant feature. Um, specifically, its horns. Um, it has horns protruding from its head. And um, depending on you know various depictions, it could have uh, a straight up, looks exactly like a bull's head, to an amorphous amalgam of a man and bull's face. So, you know, this part is really where, as a storyteller, you get to decide what makes the most sense, but it's been done several different ways. Um, the body is usually a very muscular, barbarian type looking body, a uh, humanoid, two arms, two legs, extremely muscular, sort of like a bodybuilder. Um, many depictions are where they're hairy um, and some even have it where like, you know, like the hair goes from the head, the fur, I guess you could say, furry, they're furry. The fur goes from not only the head and facial features, even it like goes down as a strip in the back, all the way through the back. Um, sometimes the, the skin color is a uh, different color than the fur and sometimes it all matches. So you might have more of a cow looking skin color where it's all covered in fur, but the body looks human. Or you might have human skin where just the fur of the head and, and the, the animalistic features. So that part really allowed to play around with a little bit. Um, the, the, one of the other significant differences is that the legs are more like a cow's hooves. So um, this, this allows, we'll talk about this more in the fighting style, but this allows the minotaur to basically um, kick like a horse or like a cow would with its hooves. It uh, will often like grind the ground when it's angry or upset. And um, it also, you know, so the legs don't, the legs look semi-human, but then at the bottom, um, they, you know, they look more like an animal. Um, what else? It also gives them the, because of that, it gives them very powerful charging abilities, the ability to charge. And then their arms usually, again, humanistic. And then when you get to about the forearm, um, you start to see an animal type of claw almost. Um, it's the, it's the fingers are humanoid or the hand is humanoid, but the fingers are more like claws in most cases. I have seen some where they're hooves. Um, I don't think that that, that makes for the best of, uh, monsters. If you're going to use them as a monster in your story, um, usually they have hands with claws, not only to fight, but also 
to hold weapons like large battle axes, large sledgehammers, spears, things of that nature. And um, that, I believe, about covers it for the physical attributes. And again, you got to think, um, you know, they're very animalistic in most depictions. They're, they're primal. They live outdoors in like tribes, if anything. Um, if they, in the sense, if they're in a community. If they're not, they usually live in a labyrinthian type of area. We'll discuss this when we get to the stages. Um, and the reason, I will, I will mention this, the reason, according to lore, um, is that it, they're very good at memorizing places, it's like an animal instinct, and so in labyrinthian type areas, it allows them to hunt their prey and their enemies significantly easier, so they, they seek out areas like that, um, they apparently... Um, some like to live alone, others like to live in tribes, and, um, you know, they're not very cleanly, so they, they have a smell about them. Depending on the version, you know, there's usually like, you know, weird drool and snot, um, but that's, that's all up to you guys. So those are the physical attributes. There's not many others that I can really think of. I mean, they're super strong. Um, can take a lot of hits. I could see how um, you could even have that they that they're strong enough to, um, you know, like heal or not strong enough, but like that they have like a healing ability because they're animalistic. Or if they have a thicker hide, then maybe that that gives them a little bit more protection. And then uh, the only other thing I'll say is that they they don't wear much armor from most uh, prototypical depictions. However, they, they do, um, they do wear, they can wear like leather type of armor and things like that. It's stuff that would be made from animal skins or maybe enemy skins if you're going that, that route. And then the last thing, because I, I heard this question asked in a different like podcast video, what, what do the females look like? In most cases, the females also have horns and their bodies are very masculine, or not masculine, muscular, sort of like an Amazon's, but they're still female looking bodies. So um, apparently they're a little bit smaller, a little bit lighter, Gen generally the, s the same similarities as a human. Um, and there's a reason for that, we'll talk about in the symbology, but the main thing is that um, their body is human and their the rest of their features are animalistic usually take form of a cow now I will give you one variation of this that'll probably blow your mind and it, it's it's just to give you some food for thought I as I said in the other video the Minotaur is a subclass of the dragon archetype, which is what I would consider the larger archetype at play here. And it's used, you use the Minotaur archetype specifically to, to for a, a specific psychological symbology that we'll discuss later. But this subclass is most best known as a Minotaur. However, there are equivalent variations, we'll say. And that equivalent variation uh, that you guys will be aware of is the Gorgon. So Medusa, who is a, a very well-known Gorgon in Greek and Roman mythology, um, is another example of the Minotaur archetype. Now, we could say that a Gorgon is the subclass of the, of the dragon archetype, and we definitely could, and we'll probably even have videos on that someday. But for m most, you know, for all intents and purposes, the, the Gorgon is another variation of this Minotaur archetype. And, um, and then when you think about it like that, as we discuss this archetype further, you'll see, oh, as I watch movies or read different books or play different video games, I can see that this archetype has been placed here. And, um, and so there you go. 
that is that is the physical attributes of the Minotaur archetype. Uh, in the next episode, we'll discuss more about um, the psychological significance and the function it plays in the story. All right, stay tuned. See you in the next video.